2024 is an absolutely special year because my YouTube channel celebrates its 10 year anniversary. For just only this year, if you would like to support me, you can do that now via visiting paypal.me slash brettcaliber. But if you do not like to do any charity, you can help yourself by buying a Windows 10 or 11 Pro retail key for still $12.50 only. That would also greatly support me. Anyway, I want to thank you all for 10 years of your amazing support. Welcome to this special video about The Last of Us and of course The Last of Us games, The Last of Us Part 1 and The Last of Us Part 2. I did decide to create this video because the trailer of The Last of Us Part 2, the TV series, was released. And I've been reflecting on what these games have meant to me because these are not just your regular action, Naughty Dog, um, Uncharted games. The Last of Us series games were so much more. They were so much deeper. And I can definitely say they have been definitely one of the most interesting games I've ever played. And if I, I can count it on one hand, like five major games, The Last of Us absolutely is one of them. It's something hard to describe but i'm going to try to do this in this video because you know um yeah this game really changed the way i've been looking at games and maybe also changed the way how i look at th things in general so let's start right away with the video i have been born in 1986 it means that i'm currently 38 years old and i can say i've been watching and playing video games since my third or fourth year which means I have experience with over 35 years of gaming. And all these years I've seen many, many games of course. We have seen amazing, wonderful, legendary, cult games, but I would say like every once and then, like every 10 years, there is a game which is not only so amazingly good, but also really leaves an impression for the rest of your life. It actually becomes part of your life. And that's of course very subjective and very dependent on what kind of console you had, what kind of PC you had, and maybe when you were a child, what kind of games your parents bought. But some of those games are becoming a legendary status for you. So not only like they're amazingly good games, but they uh, are becoming part of your life actually. The Last of Us, let's start with part one. Um, I was very late to The Last of Us. I played The Last of Us 1 only last year when it was released on a PC. Because the first time this game was released, it was in 2013. And this game was released back then on the PlayStation 3, of course. Um, but yeah, this game has been re-released so many times. There was like this remaster on the PlayStation 4. But then last year in 2023, this game had a true remake, I can say, um, like that a true remake on the PlayStation 5 and PC. And I heard so much about this game that I thought, okay, this is my moment to finally being able to play this game because I've been a PC gamer mostly of my life. Um, I had many consoles as well, uh, PlayStation 3, 4, Wii, um, yeah, you name it, but I never really was able to, to enjoy it. You know, it felt like I'm missing somewhat of a control. And of course on PC, you have better graphics. And yeah, not I not per se that consoles are bad or something, but they're not for me. I love PC, but I never really felt like I had to buy a console just to play a specific game, which was console only. So yeah, the same applied to The Last of Us Part One. It was finally on PC, and boy oh boy, the launch was freaking horrible. Bizarre glitches, uh, graphical issues, and extremely poor performance. And this is unfortunately. Also, the yeah, the, the the stigma which this game is about to be remembered for on PC, which is so so uh, fortunate. I unfortunately had a high end PC, however, with an uh, RTX 3090. It has 24 gigs of VRAM and 30 gigs of regular RAM. I had and uh, what is it, an i7 12700K. So even while this game used insane amounts of resources, I was luckily able to play this game without too many problems. So yeah, you know, I I've installed this game, started it up and I thought by myself, okay, so wow, this is really the game um, I'm, go I'm going to play in a minute or so, which is about to be, yeah, which people call like the best game ever made sometimes. And it was really, really uh, a big, anticipation for me you know because if if you have a game which have been titled and awarded so many times i've been uh, stated as one of the best games ever made 
I was really, I wasn't really sure what to expect, but I knew it had to be something good. You know, it couldn't be just the hype. This was a game which was supposed to be really, really good. So the game, um, once I was finally able to start it up after all the, the texture recompilings and whatever, but this game really um, begins with a true gut punch, something extremely intense. That was Sarah's death. And I'll be honest, I already knew what was coming because I've been spoiled about this, unfortunately. But even while I knew what was going to happen, it didn't took away the emotional impact that the scene had. And watching Sarah die in Joel's arms was really devastating, really, really devastating and really well done. And the way the scene was executed, you know, seeing the panic, the fear of, of all the people, um, uh, except also from, from the main characters at that time, Sarah, Joel and Tommy, uh, seeing the, the, the panic which happened was truly, truly, uh, yeah, convincing. That's the word I... I probably will use a lot during this review, convincing. And the first scene, seeing Sarah die, was the tone set for the rest of the games, The Last of Us 1 and 2. This was a game which was going to be next level when it came to emotion, storytelling and interaction with uh, people. Because the first thing that truly stood out to me when I played The Last of Us was how convincing and alive the characters felt i mean we all played many games with with uh, good voice actors you know and good animations sure all that kind of stuff but the last of us truly was on another level and the way how, why they why the, the characters were so convincing was because joel ellie and tess they felt real because of the facial animations were so well done and captured and the actors did a great job in, in, you know, trying to bring their mannerisms of the character, the subtle changes, in example, in their voices when they're scared or angry or trying to stay calm. This wasn't weren't just any voice actor you've seen in mostly in games, but these were true actors and the way the face animations in that and everything which belonged to it was captured. This was something truly, truly amazing. And especially in the remake, I think you saw, if you compare it with the original Last of Us, looked so good and I would I can't really remember where face animations look better than in the remake of the first Last of Us. And not just only that, because this remake the graphics were truly, truly stunning and amazing. And um, the, mo the thing which really, um, I have to say, looked the best were lighting effects. The details in the environment, like the, like the decay of the world around it. Um, yeah, it wasn't just, just like uh, good graphics. It really was very atmospheric when it comes to specific lighting effects and it really also added weight to the environments. And like every rune building, every uh, um, ab abandoned shop in, in the streets or apartment, it felt for me like it had a story to tell, not just a random place generated environment, but really handcrafted like it, it, it could have been abandoned in that world. And for that, it was what so what was so well done was that you could feel the history in the world what happened like the sadness when people had to leave and yeah the loss and and hopelessness of everything and i think the environment really really uh captured that so super well and especially in combination with the beautiful graphics the lighting effects you know that's the combination was done very very well and I think what I really loved about this game, and I do that um, uh, with games in general, if they have it, it, are the more quieter moments. I mean, The Last of Us isn't all action, like a third person action game or tension uh, about surviving uh, against the infected, but it also takes its time to let you sit with the characters and get to know them. And especially, of course, Joel and Ellie. And you watch, their relationship evolves slowly and you know and it are just these little moments that makes the bond feel so real and uh, I, an example there's this scene where they walk past the store with a picture of a skinny model and ellie asks why this model is so skinny thinking there was plenty of food in in joel's time but joel explains that some people choose to not stay uh, choose to not eat it and stay thin and Ellie, who is yeah a bit naive in this, of course, calls that stupid because there should be plenty of food and she doesn't understand why people did it. But such simple everyday moments when they are both exploring this post-apocalyptic world truly reveal so much about both characters and how 
yeah, how alive they are and how they uh, they both experience this world. And of course, Ellie is this 14 year old, bit naive girl when it comes to the past, um, the past before she was born, before the infection started, I should say. And yeah, she's now growing up in this impossibly harsh world, but she still has her sense of humor, her, her curiosity, and a little bit of innocence maybe. And Joel, despite everything, yeah, he begins to care for her like his own daughter. Like, you know, since he lost Sarah, he never really wanted to care about someone. But Ellie starts to uh, make him think about Sarah. And this, an example, this scene, it are the small things, the small moments where you can really f uh, feel Ellie and Joel bonding. And it's been done so organically and so uh, believable. And that is truly something uh, amazingly amazingly done by, by the writers about uh, The Last of Us. And I have to say, uh, story-wise, character-wise, it was, yeah, for, well, that was so good. I think the gameplay itself isn't really being talked about uh, enough. I think, of course, it's not like a super innovative gameplay. It's uh, the, 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 how do you say, the, the quick select of, of items and stuff is nothing really super special but i have to say the combat was very well done it was always intense um and it's you're definitely not a superhero you, know, you need to scrap all the stuff you can find using whatever little resources are left in this world to survive and once you're able to finally find enough um yeah things to upgrade your weapons ammo um use creating supplies it really felt like a true achievement to finally have upgraded your weapon and it really is so helpful but what's been done very well is i think every encounter you had in the game felt meaningful like your choice mattered uh what you're going to do but also they were placed there naturally not like random encounters that kind of stuff it really felt like yeah those you know either infected or um or humans belonged there and not were just placed there randomly like you sometimes see you in rpgs you know but um definitely intense the combat uh definitely you're not uh, you you definitely feel vulnerable and that's been done very very well if i have to find some bit of gameplay point which i'm a little bit negative about was to yeah the at a certain point you're constantly finding ladders or moving planks to help ellie or joel uh yeah cross the new area and it felt a little bit like the game It Takes Two. I'm not sure if you remember it, where you're playing with uh, two people and you're having a little bit of this, this dynamic to constantly trying to help each other to the new area. Um, but that's pretty much it. I think the yeah there, there was some criticism I've read about the gameplay. It was boring. I definitely don't feel that. I think the combat was very well done. The encounters felt very naturally. Um, they're not like not super many um, unnatural jump scares, you know, which you sometimes see in bad horror movies where they have to try to spice things up with just stupid jump scares. I think everything done regarding gameplay was done very naturally in the game, which is truly, truly a big compliment because that cannot be easy, you know? You have to do a lot of testing, have to do yeah, a lot of experimenting. And I think it was really, really almost perfect when it comes to combat and encounters. But at the heart of the game, of course, the relationship between Joel and Ellie is what it's all about. It starts as a simple escort mission, Joel just doing his job and Ellie is just the cargo. But that I have to say, I don't necessarily like Joel. I mean, in my opinion, he is just, yeah, as bad as the people who you were fighting against. And uh, of course he lost a lot when he lost Sarah, but I, think Joel's actions against people uh, they're fighting against are not always justifiable and for that I think I mostly only really like Ellie because she is true at who she is and um, yeah Joel is just a guy you know who gets attached to Ellie because it reminds him a lot about uh, about his daughter uh, Sarah of course. So yeah, as the game progresses, their bond deepens in, in ways that actually, again, feel believable. And I think this build-up is done very, very well. So um, Ellie also never really had a father figure. She grows to trust Joel more than anyone else. And it's not really a traditional father-daughter relationship, of course, but it's getting really close. And I think the build-up and the way they execute it was really, really amazing. Also, I think one of the most iconic moments moments is the giraffe scene. 
After all the chaos and violence, you're giving this quiet, peaceful moment where Joel and Ellie, Ellie watches Jura's roam uh, through the ruins of the city. That was a really, really cool scene. And I think somewhat of a reminder that uh, nature will find its way again, you know, just like the famous Jeff Goldblum quote from uh, Jurassic Park. Eventually nature will find its way. And yeah, I think that was a really cool scene. And I think it's a cool, um, yeah, quiet before the storm moment before the finale is coming. And I think this is this was very well done. Even while I didn't understood it much at the first time I played this game, um, because yeah, there's a lot of characters, dialogue and stuff, but I have to say it's done so very well. So what happens is the um, at the end, the most controversial moment probably, Joel makes the decision to save Ellie and with that actually dooming humanity because the Fireflies believe that Ellie is actually the key to creating a cure with her immunity. And to do that, unfortunately, she has to die. But even, you know, um, even if that's a risk, they can save entire humanity and mankind. And nobody actually cared to ask Ellie if she would be ready for that. So uh, Joel refuses to let it happen. And he fights his way through the hospital, killing everyone in his path. And um, yeah, with that, I also have to say this scene was a little bit immersion breaking. Because Joel goes as a one-man army against all these people. But okay, you know, the, the power of this scene, I think, is justifiable for, for that. Um, and of course, in the, uh, Joel kills the doctor who is about to operate an Ellie. And who is actually kind of innocent. Um, and in The Last of Us 2, we find out who he is. But we're going to talk about that later. Um, but what's, what's so well done in the end is... Ellie asks Joel in the end when they're um, yeah uh, at, the, at the last scene if what he told her was actually true. So if there were others like her and that the Fireflies didn't necessarily need her, he just lies. And it's kind of like a heartbreaking moment because it changes the uh, honesty and purity, I think, in Joel and Ellie. And Joel doesn't want to um, yeah, tell Ellie the truth in that, in, that, uh, in that situation. And in Joel's mind, he's doing it because of love and he can't lose Ellie the way he lost Sarah by letting her die during the operation. Um, yeah, but he's also taking away her own choice if she actually wants to sacrifice herself. And this decision, you know, and the way the game ends, I think this was an exceptionally good ending that like, you know, it is not something super cinematic that uh, Joel sacrifices himself or, uh, you know, like a big action scene. I think this end, how subtle and uh, how good it was, was really, really awesome to end the game with. And what the game does is it doesn't give you an easy answer or a an opinion about this, you know. Is Joel right? Is Ellie right? Um, or at least Joel is not right, but it does, was his motive correct? You know, and that's what makes it so powerful. Um, and the thing I have to say with that, then I truly, with that, I truly understood the insane, uh, awesome storyline um, and, and character development between Ellie and Joel and everything that happened with the Fireflies and the decision Joel makes to save Ellie or at least save in, in his way and prevent her from dying. And yeah, I have to say with that, the first thing, because I didn't really 100% understood everything, was like, okay, this was an amazing game, but is this like really the best game ever made, according to a lot of people? But till this day, I have to say, I'm still thinking about The Last of Us 1 and later The Last of Us 2. That's how uh, how amazing this game is with um, yeah raising situations of moral, of asking yourself a moral question. And I think... You know, there's no other game for me personally who has ever, ever done this, which has ever done this to me. So with that, bravo to The Last of Us 1. I agree, it is definitely one of the best games ever made. Is it because of the gameplay? Not per se, but it is because of the way they tell the relation, uh, they explain and yeah, um, you know, uh, you see the relationship between Ellie and Joel grow and seeing Joel making these questionable ask, uh, actions and yeah, you as a player having to decide for yourself if he was right or wrong and all the decisions which Ellie and Joel make if yeah um, if this that would be something if that would be something you would have done yourself or not so fantastic fantastic game the last of us part 1 so after finishing the last of us part 1 i was truly obsessed with the game i couldn't stop thinking about the ending i couldn't stop thinking about Ellie about Joel 
the world itself and especially what would happen next because I knew The Last of Us Part 2 was out there. You know? I played this game in 2023, The Last of Us Part 1, and The Last of Us Part 2 was uh, remastered for PlayStation 5. So yeah, it was out there already. All the answers were out there. And uh, during yeah, a lot of my um, checking of the lore, I unfortunately got spoiled and uh, some things which happened in The Last of Us Part 2. Um, but the, I wanted to play this game so badly, part two, but it was not on PC yet. Maybe now, if you're watching in 2025, it is already. But till uh, till this day now, while recording, The Last of Us Part Two is not on PC. So I had to make a decision, and that was for the first time in 35 years, get a PlayStation 5 to play The Last of Us Part Two. Uh, the way how I got my PlayStation 5 was something I uh, hope never to uh, yeah, have it in that kind of way because my uh, sister's husband died, unfortunately. And after a, a pretty shitty time uh, arranging a lot of things with my sister and, um, uh, you know, uh, the funeral, everything that happens along it, after it, you probably know it yourself if you ever lost someone close where you had to arrange things. We're checking through his goods and yeah, my sister didn't really knew what to do with his, with his um, uh, stuff and his electronics and he had a PlayStation 5 so I offered to buy it from her so she couldn't, yeah, know it was at least in good hands. And that was actually the way I got a PS5 and was able to play uh, The Last of Us Part 2. So it was special in a way that to do it on his PlayStation 5 and yeah, you know, it's from there. Um, I, I, I bought the game digital, digitally, I thought, and was able to finally play The Last of Us Part 2. So by the time I started playing The Last of Us Part 2, it was this year, 2024, the hype had died down in a way that the controversies, the leaked spoilers, the backlash over certain narrative choices, I completely forgot about them, they existed. It was all in the past and honestly, I was actually glad being able to play it three four years afterwards because of yeah all the headlines we had back then about all the choices this game had to be honest i kind of forgot them and also because at the time i never thought i would be able to play this game because i only had the pc and at that time that was there was no uh, any yeah any hint or something these games would ever come to pc so yeah the, the um, that was a great thing because i could play this game as intended as it was without any of the backlash or any uh, controversies etc etc i have to say with that i find it very um very disturbing when i when i check back is that an example the face actress who played abby uh, was just a girl who was working at naughty dog studios and she got all kind of death threats via twitter and other social media well, the sad story about it is, is that she didn't even work anymore at Naughty Dog when this game was released. And the story was that someone from Naughty Dog asked her if they could use her face for a certain game. But she had no idea back then it would be The Last of Us Part 2. So it's double sad and it is really, really insane that people started actually threatening her as, as yeah, just a face, uh, face model for Abby. And you thought you know maybe now three four years that will all be over but it appears that the actress who plays abby in the last of us series is also having security on set as the only actress and with that i just don't understand who are these people who are threatening actresses for video games or a series in this case it's really 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 insane people are actually doing that the only concern I had before I started with The Last of Us Part 2 was that I had a little bit of a feeling I had with the original Matrix. Uh, after The Matrix was released in 1999 and later in 2003, I think in 2005 or something, they got two sequels, The Matrix Reloaded and Matrix Revolutions. The thing with The Matrix was that it was a fantastic, almost perfect movie when it came to lore, to mystery about the world. Uh, like Zion, an example, the, the only remaining human city, was that the Matrix Reloaded and Revolutions were going to fill in that fantasy for you, which you might have with the world and the mystery. And with that, I was afraid The Last of Us Part Two might also fill some of your own thoughts in, in a way that you might have, yeah, uh, might not agree or disagree. So that's a little bit of the matrix effect, matrix effect i had with the last of us part 2 but of course i was super happy to play the last of us part 2 
I can say before I'm going to uh, talk more about The Last of Us Part 2, the first thing I had with this game was unease. I was super uncomfortable uh, seeing Ellie grown up being a 19 year old girl. What that I meant was like the innocent, uh, naive, funny Ellie we saw in The Last of Us Part 2 was now a grown up woman, like a young woman, 90 years old I think she was. And with that she lost her innocence and yeah, it's 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 like you know having a little niece and seeing her all all of a sudden grown up after seeing her not for five years. I, I felt really really uncomfortable with that, and I have to say big credits to Naughty Dog because they done that so well in my case that you know all of a sudden you see little Ellie all grown up, being 19, uh, having yeah having to face all the shit in the real world. So that was the first thing I had because I think the game started in Jackson, the city seeing her uh, that and pretty soon already seeing the, um, the what is it, the the scene with Dina so yeah like the young Ellie now all of a sudden grown up with love with uh, yeah all the terror in the world all the, the all the shit that grown ups have to go through so that was i have to say my first thought when starting up the last of us part 2 and then pretty fast one of uh, probably the most controversial scene in all of Last of Us games happened, the famous golf club scene. It is it was at least as impactful as, of course, Sarah Dad's was in part one. But the thing, the problem with this was, um, because I knew this was going to happen, while the scene was so heartbreaking, it had a, a somewhat of a double meaning, I think, for a lot of people, was that a lot of um, marketing material on the Last of Us part two trailers pretty much portrayed that the wonderful uh, relationship Ellie and Joel had in The Last of Us Part 1 was also there in The Last of Us Part 2. I think it was really strong that Joel died. I do think it was not as strong that Joel died immediately at the start of the game. I think this is of course the reason why people were pissed off. I think it would be way more forgiving that uh, Joel would die at three quarter of the game. I think that would have been perfect. But yeah, apparently the developers wanted to be Abby as the new main character. Why I'm not, I still do not know. I mean, I, I, I have, yeah, I don't think it was of wokeness or something, but um, for some reason they wanted to have Abby as the second main character and they wanted to, yeah, write off Joel so fast. It's, I have to agree with the controversy that I thought that was a kind of a strange decision and it really, uh, yeah, pissed people off that, they have to play like at least half the game with Abby. And with that, I thought that was pretty much the only mistake they made, uh, killing off Joel so fast. And uh, when it comes to like uh, inclusivity, wokeness and stuff, I think for the rest, it's not that yeah horrible as, as it was portrayed back then. An example, sure, Ellie has a relationship with Dina, but I think in The Last of Us 1 DLC, um, it was pretty clear already that Ellie had interesting girls, you know, even if bisexual or not, she showed then already as a 14 year old, she was already interested in, in uh, not only guys or maybe only girls at that time. So I don't think that's really much of a surprise. And then, uh, yeah, the other thing, Abby itself, of course, I, I watched a lot of things like she's a transgender, that's bullshit. I mean, she. Uh, we clearly saw some some um, some flashback scenes where she was just a girl, you know. And I personally always thought she became so muscular and buffed was since her father died that she was going to train, you know, get tougher, that kind of stuff. I would be. I would see more plausible than being a transgender because, uh, yeah, that's. I think that those things are being dragged through it as somewhat of an. Um, I don't know, uh, somewhat of an excuse to, to bash this game. And then the last thing I read was that people uh, thought it was woke that Mel was pregnant, the girl who also um, is in the world. I find that super strange because yeah, you know, it's still a, it's still a world where people live and, uh, you know, and, and get pregnant. So what, uh, what, what else can she do? She can't just sit and wait until everything gets her right. She has to survive herself as well. So I think a lot of thing where a lot of things were completely overreacted, but I have to say, I kind of felt, um, this was definitely not the best choice letting Joel die so early, especially if you market it in the way that this game would be again with Ellie and Joel. So, uh, so yeah, starting with the rest of this game, I wanted to have that off my chest. And then, yeah, the famous golf club scene. I knew it was going to happen, but this is, I think, by far the most brutal and devastating scene ever, ever in a video game. 
Again, I've been playing games for 35 years and I can't remember seeing a scene which is so horrible like this one. I, I, not horrible, also devastating seeing Joel like this and seeing Abby, uh, Ellie having to force watch seeing Joel die. And big compliment to Ashley Johnson. That must not have been an easy scene uh, to act. Uh, and she done it so, so amazingly well. And yeah, with, that, with this scene, you know, um, the, what, what I've been thinking is because when I checked out a lot of lore about The Last of Us 1 and 2, I see a lot of younger girls who identify with Ellie, like girls who are 14, 15, uh, f sorry, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, in their teens, um, obsessed with Ellie. They must have played or seen these scenes as well. And I think this is really heavy if you're that young and watching these scenes because a game, uh, I think this is one of the few games which is really 18 plus as in, um, yeah, normally you could say Call of Duty, GTA, violence, okay, but uh, you know, it's not really that impactful for you as, as a teen. But I think a game like this, like The Last of Us 2, especially Last of Us 2, is for a young teen mind very, very impactful, especially, especially a scene like this. So yeah, th I, I think this is not something which has been um, addressed um, a lot, but I know, yeah, I've seen a lot of, of teen girls identifying with Ellie, maybe also uh, girls which are um, bi curious or something, you know, and they uh, have her somewhat as a role model, sure. But these scenes are really, really heavy for um, yeah, someone being in their teens, teen years. Um, the scene itself, I have to say, I had some questions about it, something which I don't see much about. First thing is, I don't really understand why uh, Tommy and Joel use their own names, their real names, for to a group they don't know, they never met. Because Joel must know a lot of people uh, have heard of him by now, uh, and especially since he is traveling with Ellie, the girl who is immune. So that's a little bit fake for me why they used, hey, I'm Joel and this is Tommy, and yeah, you know, especially in that combination as brothers, they, they definitely rang a bell at the group of Abby. So a bit strange, they use their own names. And also what I don't really understand how heartbreaking the scene already is, I don't understand why Abby's group doesn't kill Tommy and Ellie. I mean, uh, no half measures, right? Especially not in a world where they live in right now, where everyone is so brutal already. I didn't really understand why they didn't kill Tommy and Ellie. And I can remember there was like a flashback in uh, Abby's group where they talk about this, why they left them alive. Um, I think it had something to do with Mel not wanting to do that, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> you don't want to take half measures, right? Especially not with doing something like this. You know uh, Tommy and Ellie would seek vengeance and you would seek revenge. So. This scene quite controversial, of course, but I also have a little bit of my own questions about uh, about this scene. And this scene really starts the actual game, The Last of Us Part Two. This really starts the uh, full gameplay. Uh, yeah, um, how do you say this is like the fire starter for the full game and every decision and everything which has to do something with this game is built on that because. You're playing with Ellie again, but now it's more of a revenge story. Um, yeah, you know, Ellie and uh, is with Dina and they're going after Abby and the group. That's where this game is pretty much about. So, um, yeah, the, the, it's, it's becoming more of a revenge story. And I have to say what's done really well about this is that this shows how revenge cons consumed Ellie, you know, it destroyed everything in her path. And I have to say, at first you don't really realize this, but if you watching back, you see Ellie slowly unravel and seeing how her obsession with finding and killing Abby, killing Abby turns her into something you barely recognize from the young Ellie you've seen in The Last of Us Part 1. And with that, I, th I do think it's very strong that they do have the flashbacks when Ellie was younger, like 16, like two years later when she was 14, she still was this kind girl, you know, and she still hadn't seen much uh, horrors of the world yet. And with that, you know, I, I think maybe this game makes Ellie a little bit too dark and uh, she already has seen a lot of hor horrible things, but uh, it's like, yeah, it's like the 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 extra kick which really uh, makes it, um, yeah, pretty bad for her as a character. I don't think she deserves all of this, um, but yeah, The Last of Us Part Two definitely is a very very dark, um, 
uh, yeah, a very dark second part of a more, yeah, how do you say it, a more easier part one when it comes to connection between people. I think this one, it's 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 a really different dark direction than the Last of Us Part One. So yeah, it is what it is. If you like it or not, half a, the half of the game you're playing as Abby, the girl who killed Joel. At first, I didn't really care much about Abby. Um, yeah, I didn't necessarily hate her, that, like a lot of other people did. But I think Naughty Dog wanted to really turn the tide by showing who Abby really was, the 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 stuff she went through and. Um, and seeing things from her perspective and that was Abby lost pretty much everything already just like Ellie her father was a surgeon who uh, Joel killed in the first Last of Us of course and her quest for revenge was as personal as Ellie's as the one yeah Ellie had but um, I think of course when you see for the first time her father was the surgeon uh, this is the biggest revelation in the game and I think this is the point where people probably would have uh, more respect for Abby um, but I think the damage was done already I personally think people didn't really let it go that easy that Joel died you know and and they even while they had some sympathy with this that uh, Abby's father was a surgeon they didn't still really forgive Abby and with that I th I'm not sure if this is something which Naughty Dog expected because especially since the huge backlash this game backlash this game actually had but yeah, they tried to show Abby as uh, just a regular, you know, loving, caring girl. And I think they tried it an example with, um, with, with that she cared for the people who were close to her in this world. And also an example, her relationship that she likes dogs. And later, of course, we see Lev and Yara, the two uh, Seraphid uh, children. Um, I think it was somewhat, um, yeah, of, of an effort to really show... Um, Abby and, and, and Lev, which is of course the only one who stays alive, uh, Yara unfortunately dies, and show their bond, how caring Abby actually is. But I personally think it's a little bit, not forced, but it's not as genuine and not as real and not as uh, convincing, like I said in Last of Us Part 1, it's not as convincing as it was with Ellie and Joel. So with that, I think, sure, they did a, they did a great effort trying everyone to like, to like and love Ellie, uh, sorry, Abby, but I think they, yeah, they didn't really succeed in that. Also, if I'm currently on the criticism train, what I also had a little bit of criticism about the other side characters, an example, I didn't really care about Jesse, uh, um, Dina's ex. Also, I think it was a pretty strange way the way he died. Like all of a sudden, uh, boom, and it's like you'd never really heard much about him or people really cared about the death of, uh, of Jesse. That was super, super strange. And the other criticism point I have with playing Ellie and Abby um, is that they're now one man, or I should say one girl armies, you know? They're just teen girls. and. They starting on a huge killing spree, killing uh, trained military people, uh, all kind of people like Terminators. I find that a little bit immersion breaking. And I understand this is a video game still. In the end, you need to shoot the people and, and not only uh, infect it. But I found this a little bit um, yeah, an immersion breaking. And it also, if you're really honest, the main characters are teen girls. It felt a little bit like... Um, yeah, like a Twilight-ish uh, almost kind of, of 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 game with two teen female characters. You know, that was a bit strange, if I'm honest. I really thought Ellie and Joel in Last of Us Part Two was an absolute brilliant chemistry. So, yeah, you know, I, I appreciate they try to force to see things from multiple different perspectives when it comes to Abby and Ellie, but. I think they didn't really 100% uh, succeed in that. So that's a little bit about the negative I, I have about uh, The Last of Us Part Two, And I also think that the end is not super satisfying as well. I mean, uh, first of all, this game is long. You know, it's for me, I had the feeling it was like two or three times as long almost as The Last of Us Part One, But... It's not too long. I enjoyed every, every moment of it. And if you compare, uh, compare it, an example, with a Ubisoft game like a new Assassin's Creed or Far Cry 6, those games are just too long and they drag on too long. But I think The Last of Us Part 2 was long, but not too long. Again, I loved everything about it. So yeah, 
Um, I think it's a truly um, uh, value for money game when it comes to content and yeah, you know, a long story and a long game. And it ends with the final confrontation, confrontation between Ellie and Abby. And it is really brutal, you know, because by this point, both characters are broken physically, emotionally, mentally, and they're doing a hand-to-hand -hand fight to the death. Um, to be really honest, I had no idea which way it, it, it uh, went, um, yeah, which way this fight was going to end. I somewhat knew that Ellie wasn't going to die, but I didn't know if she would kill Abby, yes or no. And in the end, Ellie decides to let Abby go. And I think it was a pretty powerful moment, but I think it was also very anti-climax, anti um, if I'm really honest. And I can understand Ubi uh, sorry, Ubisoft, uh, Naughty Dog did it because they want to break a cycle of violence and somewhat that it doesn't, yeah, you know, that you should forgive and that kind of stuff. I, okay, I understand it, but for me, it was a little bit unforgiving. Um, yeah, you know, it doesn't feel like a victory and maybe that's also the strength of the game. But the really, the end end scene is like, you see Ellie coming back to the house with, uh, yeah, where uh, Dina and JJ was. Um, but she lost everything, you know. Joel is gone. Uh, also, Tommy is not really on good foot with her. But then she realizes uh, Dina and JJ, the, the kid that Dina and, um, uh, that, uh, that Dina had, uh, with Jesse is also gone, you know, and you see her, um, yeah, trying to play guitar, which doesn't work because her fingers are bit off. So the game ends on a pre pretty much of a bittersweet note and a really, really kick in the face to Ellie, if I'm really honest. I think they did Ellie really, really dirty, uh, you know, and uh, it was, uh, yeah, they, they pretty much, she, she pretty much self-destructed her with her revenge for Abby because I think she could have uh, chosen to stay with Dina and JJ, you know, but yeah, for that, the end was really, uh, maybe the entire game was a really kick in the face to Ellie, and I don't think she deserved that, even if it's, you know, it's a choice of Naughty Dog. I think it's a bit strange that this game maybe was so dark, but still, I really, really loved the game, you know, it's also was a lot, a lot to process, um, because it was such a long game. But still, also with The Last of Us 2, I'm still thinking about this every day. Um, you know, the characters, also what happened to Dina, what happened to JJ, what happened to Ellie, of course. Um, and with that, yeah, I, I think a third part is needed to do Ellie some justice. You know, she has been done really uh, dirty, I think, in The Last of Us Part 2. She has been broken in pretty much every way a girl can be broken, lost everyone. Um, yeah, I think a third part is needed to complete her story. For me, it doesn't feel complete. And I've been thinking a lot. I've been thinking a lot how this game can end. And I've been thinking about four theories, four theories I have for this game. I would say the first one is the happy ending, the more boring, predictable one. And that would be like Ellie and Dina and JJ find each other again, live a peaceful life. Uh, you know, and end with with that on that note. It's a nice thought uh, that it might happen, but for me, it would feel a bit too clean for a series as yeah, emotional and controversial and complex as well as The Last of Us. So this would be like a more Hollywood ending. I, I don't see it happen, to be really honest, but it could happen. A bit more interesting ending, I would say, would be Abby and Ellie working together, you know, um, because maybe they're joining each other at the Fireflies, maybe they fight first, but then realize they should work together. And it could be like a game about redemption and learning to forgive. Um, I, I think they can make it work, but it might also feel a little bit forced. So. I think this might be uh, yeah, a direction where, where they can, where uh, Naughty Dog could go to, but that would also mean you will probably play as Abby and Ellie. And I'm not also sure if that will be a great idea for The Last of Us Part 3, but I would definitely see, this, see that as a possible ending. I think then the last two endings I thought of were a little bit more um, satisfying and also controversial. I think the most satisfying and powerful ending would be for me if Ellie sacrificed herself still. While she didn't have the chance by Joel, um, she would still sacrifice herself to create the cure for humanity. And it would bring her journey full circle. Um, you know, she has lost so much, she must 
be so miserable at this point. And to make things even more uh, more controversial might be that Abby would be the one who could perform the surgery, uh, making it somewhat of a very ironic twist. But I think that would be uh, at least the part that Ellie would sacrifice herself for a cure for humanity would be the most powerful and maybe also most logical choice for a possible Last of Us Part 3. And then my favorite one, a uh, very controversial one, but I think I, I love this idea. What if Ellie would fall in love with someone new, someone who reminds her of Joel, and it is actually a guy instead of a girl? And why would that be that interesting? Because maybe if she then, uh, you know, maybe maybe you, rem you remember the line that she told in The Last of Us Part 1 or 2, I think it was Part 2, the thing she fears the most is uh, ending up alone. And I think it will be a great ending scene that, you know, she gets in love with a guy and gets pregnant. And then you will see the game ending uh, that she talks to the at the grave of Joel saying, I will never be alone anymore because it turned out she's pregnant from a guy. This will definitely surprise friend and foe, in my opinion. You know, I think this is something nobody would ever expect. But I thought it would be super, super funny. Uh, funny, this may be the bad word, but it would be super controversial that she actually falls in love with a guy, you know, because it reminds her of Joel. And she gets pregnant and it will be a happy ending because, yeah, she will never be alone and maybe name the baby Joel. Who knows? Um, but I think, personally, I think the most powerful ending would be if Ellie would sacrifice herself for, um, yeah, for a cure. And I think that would be bring the game in full circle. Her original mission, you know, going to the Fireflies, but this time actually choosing herself to sacrifice herself for a cure. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much what I, all I have to say about The Last of Us Part 1 and Part 2. I think the story, everything uh, about it has been so well written, so well um, yeah, worked out, you know. This game, I could say, somewhat changed my life. It's, 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 it's still, you know, every day I think about this game, um, about how it can end, how a possible Last of Us Part 3 can end. And it really, yeah, sometimes literally keeps me up at night, thinking a lot still about this game. And there are not many games which done that especially not so long after the uh yeah after i finished the games you know of course sometimes when you finish a game you think about it still a day or two maybe but not as long and not as intense as the last of us part one and two have done so yeah with that i really wanted to create this video i know probably not of people will watch this especially not at the end if you're um if you're still watching this i'm wondering type in uh comments let's say what shall we do type in the fireflies are here if you're still watching this i would be super curious if people made it all the way to the end and with that i want to thank you all for listening to my monologue about the last of us part one and two these were very very special games to play and uh if you're a pc gamer start with if you're a pc gamer just like me start with the last of us part one on pc the the game has been you know patched all the way up it should be playable uh fine right now and I think next year when the Last of Us Part, uh, sorry, the Last of Us series Part Two are released, also the game will be released on PC. So either wait for that then, or yeah, if you really can't wait like me, get a PS5 or uh, or uh, I don't know, um, try to borrow it from someone, play it then. And yeah, really for me, this was really, really an amazing experience. So if you're all the way still here, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you at one of my next videos.